Christ is just like the human body. A body is a unit and has many parts, and all the parts of the body are one body, even though there are many. We were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek or slave or free, and we all were given one spirit to drink. Certainly the body isn't one part, but many. If the foot says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that mean it's not part of the body? If the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, does that mean it's not part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, what would happen to the hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, what would happen to the sense of smell? But as it is, God has placed each one of the parts in the body just like he wanted. If all were one and the same body part, what would happen to that body? But as it is, there are many parts but one body. So the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Or in turn, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Instead, the parts of the body that people think are the weakest are the most necessary. The parts of the body that we think are less honorable are the ones we honor the most. The private parts of our body that aren't presentable are the ones that are given the most dignity. The parts of our body that are presentable don't need this. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the part with less honor, so that there won't be division in the body, and so the parts might have mutual concern for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part gets the glory, all the parts celebrate with it. You are the body of Christ and parts of each other. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Morning, friends. My name is Marcus Womack. I'm the minister of outreach here, one of our associate pastors. It's a joy to be with you today. Our uh, men's retreat is happening this weekend, so our senior pastor, Billy Eccles Richter, is away with them, and Laura is actually preaching across the way in the sanctuary this morning. So it's a joy to worship with you all at celebration today. Um, As we have this great conversation about what it means to belong to each other, will you pray with me? God of love and God of grace, this is your time, and we are your people. Open our hearts, our minds, and our lives to your presence that we would receive your word and respond with all that we are. Amen. So over these few weeks, last week, this week, and another couple weeks ahead, we want to talk as a church about what it means to be connected together in service to one another and in service to the world. That, as we talked about last week, we all have different gifts We all have different things that we bring to the work of the church together and they are all valuable and we need the diversity that is within each of us. And we can do so much, not in spite of our differences, but because of our differences. And what does it mean that service can connect us together? And today we have this great continuation of that theme. Um, Paul, with the church in Corinth, has a lot of things he's trying to encourage them in because, let's be honest, they probably needed a lot of encouragement They may not have been doing these things well. And so he begins with this pretty intense literal list of things that they need to work on. You're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. And then he gets metaphorical with them. Imagine that you're a body and that you have to work in concert together. Imagine that you are these different senses that need each other to get the whole picture. So in all the ways that we are invited into division and disagreement and conflict... Paul reminds us that in Christ, through the Holy Spirit, because of the image of God that's created in each of us, we are part of each other. We are brought together, literally membered together, as a body that needs one another. In the time that we're living in in this world today, I can't imagine a better message to hear of an encouragement that we belong to each other and need each other across our divisions. I mean, I could probably just ask you right now, think of many ways that our world invites us to think of how we're different and divided. You can probably come up in your mind of a few things, whether that's politics, gender, generations. I saw this thing on the news the other day that Gen X got left off of a list of generations in American society, and what does that mean for everyone's value? Um, We're divided around our income, we're divided around education, 
We're divided in my family because I went to the University of Texas and literally everyone else in my family went to A&M. <laughs> Talk about needing to overcome our differences and our divisions. Though Thanksgiving's gotten a lot easier over the last few years since we don't play as much oh, or at all. Maybe one day, maybe one day. So often, I think the conversations of our lives, if we're living in the surface level area, can just be about how we are different. And then I find that temptation that in the ways that I'm different, I want to then defend how I am me. (laughs) I want to make sure that I feel very confident in what makes me me. And then if I disagree with you, particularly like in social media, I want to make sure that I'm very verbose in arguing about how me being me is probably better than, or at least more right than, however you are you if that's different. And I'm sure Jesus is so happy when I get tempted by that kind of way of being. Or I'm tempted by those things that say, sure, we're all humans, but we live in a hierarchy, right? We live in a world where CEOs make so much money and custodians make so much money, and that's the market value of the skills and the person. I think in this community, we can feel that, right? There's this great sense that we need our schools to be great so that our children can achieve, we can have success, we can have so much achievement. I worry for us that that then gives us a different sense of value that we think, oh, there's, there's something inherently more valuable about me than other people. If I have done a certain thing, worked a certain way, gotten a certain degree, made a certain amount of money. I said this last week in talking about our differences of spiritual gifts. Paul is reminding us that there is no such thing as a first class type of Christian and then a second class type of Christian. I would also extend that, I think I can extend that to say there's no such thing as a first class type of human or a second class type of human. And Paul goes to great lengths to tell us today that there is not one more important part of our community or a lesser part, that we belong, we are part of each other. It's kind of subversive because this was not new language for Paul in his day and age. There were a lot of ways to think about organizations and groups of people and community being a body. But it was very hierarchical. You know, you had the head and the heart that were leading the way, and then you had to have your hands and your feet to do the labor. But one was certainly more important than the other, and Paul turns that up on its head and says, none of us are more important than the other. There is an equality and an equity that we all belong And what a beautiful picture of that for the church. And what a beautiful offering for the church to be that light for the world if we can do this right. That you don't have to be enough of this, enough of this, enough of this, enough of of this to matter, to have value, to have worth. But as you are, you are valuable. As you are, you are worthy. As you are, you are welcome. And you have something to offer. God already sees us this way. And Paul is inviting us through the calling we have through Christ, through the power of the Spirit, to see one another the way God already sees us. Like He gets a little silly with it though, right? It's like my three-year-old. We got head and shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Eyes and ears and mouth and nose. It's all part of the body working together. I love what he says. He gets pretty strong about it. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. And the parts of the body that people think are the weakest are the most necessary. What a vision of community to offer the world. To say that there, there isn't any one of us that's expendable. There isn't any one of us that doesn't matter. I love this because it means that we are interdependent. We have got to find a way not to do everything alike, not to agree about everything, not to do everything the same, 
but that we absolutely rely on one another to get the fullest picture of God's work in the world and the fullest picture of ourselves. Maybe one of the biggest hurdles in receiving this message is believing that you yourself have something to offer, let alone that someone who is different from you has something to offer to you. That is transformation. That is, I think, truly poignant if we let it sit in our hearts a little bit. And it gives us this way of mutual concern for each other that he says in verse 25, that if one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. If one part gets the glory, all parts celebrate with it. You are the body of Christ and parts of each other. I know one of the biggest temptations that we are invited into in our culture for a lot of reasons is to just go it alone and you live your own individual life and I live my own individual life and those things don't have to cross paths if we can just keep our heads down, be polite, mind our manners. I see this in my life of my desire to drive up into my house in my little subdivision neighborhood and even get inside with hopefully not engaging my next door neighbors if I can because man, I just, I gotta get inside, I have things to do. Or I got to get to work. Or I see it in coming to church that hopefully we can come and sit here and you get what you need and you get what you need and I get what I need, but those things don't necessarily have to cross-pollinate. But then that feels like we come here to be alone together for an hour or so. And friends, Paul is saying, if that's our hope, then we're missing it. We don't come here just to get a bunch of individual inspirations. We come here to be connected with God and connected to one another and that those things are inextricably linked. That that greatest commandment to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, one needs the other. This is not like a video game where I'm unlocking my next achievement for me and you're unlocking your achievement for you. One of the things I love most about being a United Methodist is the way at our highest ideals we offer this out there. And we've struggled with this in the church about who is in leadership and how we do this work together. There have been times in our history that you absolutely had to be wide enough and male enough and wise enough to be a leader in the United Methodist Church. But as we have grown together, we've realized this scripture calls us to more diversity, greater learning, greater acceptance, And we're still figuring that out. We don't agree and we're not of one mind about what it means to be in leadership around LGBTQ inclusion. And we're talking about that and praying about that as a church. Hopefully you came to some of our listening sessions or consider that stuff online. But as a church, we say that this is a place for leadership and engagement for all people, not just the able-bodied or the young or the experienced or, or, or. Wherever you come from, whatever your experience, it is vital to the life of God in this world. It is vital in this room here. When you look around this room, I invite you to just take a minute, look around. You're looking at the image of God when you look around this room. A lot of times when we pray and worship, I keep my eyes open to look around because it reminds me that this is the body of Christ, the presence of God among us, alive in each of us. And I need that reminder that it isn't just me and my experience, that it is all of us together. Maybe do that this week, some other time when you're praying in a group like this. Look around the room and see all the different ways God shows up. All the different ways that we need one another. I like to say that this isn't just my uh, time to give you all the thoughts that I have and all the wisdom I have, even though, yes, I'm literally on a platform and I have a degree and a title and all of those things. Um, I see that I need the response from each of us in a two-way conversation around this scripture for it to truly do what I think it's supposed to do for us. All that we do is a two-way street in the giving and in the receiving And I hope that's the kind of life we're invited into. I I wanna offer up a word for us that is a huge reminder for me of this way of being. And it is very different from a lot of the invitations I've been given in my life. Um, This is a word I first heard from Archbishop Reverend uh, Desmond Tutu in his work in South Africa, moving through apartheid. Talk about a country that was divided 
and a country across race, economics, power, trying to figure out a new life over and against injustice. This word is Ubuntu. Maybe you're familiar with it. Let's say it together. Ubuntu. One more time with feeling. Ubuntu. Um, He has this kind of long quote, but I want to read it for us today because I think it's really poignant about what Ubuntu means, and I think it's very much connected to this life of the body being together. He says, Ubuntu is a very difficult word to render in Western language. It speaks to the very essence of being human. When we want to give high praise to someone, we say, you un Ubuntu. Hey, so-and-so has Ubuntu. Then you are generous, you are hospitable. You are friendly and caring and compassionate. You share what you have. It is to say, my humanity is caught up, is inextricably bound up in yours. We belong in a bundle of life. We say a person is a person through other persons. It's not just our individual stories. It is not, I think, therefore, I am. It says, rather, I am human because I belong. I participate. I share. A person with Ubuntu is open and available to others, affirming of others, does not feel threatened that others are able and good, for he or she has a proper self-assurance that comes from knowing that he or she belongs in a greater whole and is diminished when others are humiliated or diminished, when others are tortured or oppressed or treated as if they were less than who they are. That, friends, is Ubuntu. I first heard this idea when I was about 14 in a Bible study, um, probably around some of this same conversation. What does it mean for us to be different in the church and yet still rely on each other and be in, interdependently woven together? And it's an idea that has kept on popping up in my life. It has become truly for me one of those vision, um, mission words in my heart and in my life, like the why that I exist. When I say, oh yeah, the most important thing for me is love God and love neighbor, Ubuntu is how I do that, that I look at each of you and say, my thriving, my life, for life and life abundant is caught up in your thriving and your life and life abundant. I'm mutually bound up in you and your There's no space between us. Now that gets complicated when we disagree and have division. Yes, that is such a great idea until you want to vote differently than me. (laughs) Or you want to have a different style of worship than me. Or you want to go someplace different for dinner than me. And yet the deepest calling that we are given from Paul today and truly given from Christ today is that God is calling us to a bigger imagination about how we live together. Christ would go so far as to say this is about loving God and loving neighbor and even loving enemy. Talked last week on MLK Weekend about this beloved community that turns enemies into friends. Mahatma Gandhi would say even into family. On my average day, I will tell you, I don't wake up with that kind of imagination. It is a lot of hard work to look at the world, look at the things that divide us, the very real painful things that divide us, and say, there is something redeemable there. God has a different vision there than I do. Most days I want to wake up and say, I don't even know. I better just look out for me. But I keep coming back here week after week. Yes, I understand. I get paid to be here week after week. But in my faith, day after day, week after week, I am reminded over and over and over again that that is missing the point of following Jesus Christ and being saved by Jesus Christ and being saved for the world to know the grace and love of Jesus Christ. God's imagination is about our interconnectedness. God's imagination is about healing and restoration and reconciliation beyond our deepest divisions that my thriving is bound up in yours and yours in mine. The last idea I would put up here for us today is what that means when I look at the world and our divisions is that I'm reminded that there is no them. There is no them. 
as often as I'm invited to see that kind of dichotomy and division, that it is me against you, us against them, all of those divisions in your heart that are at conflict with one another, one side versus another, we've got to have winners, we've got to have losers, in God's will being done and God's kingdom coming, we are invited to transcend those things and see that we need each other. We can't just say, I don't need you because you're part of me and I'm part of you. I don't know what that looks like in your life. I know what it looks like in mine, that I can't just assume that I've always got the right answers or I've always got the right way to be. For me, it means waking up in the morning and asking, especially when I see conflict and division, what is the possibility of love? I have a mentor who likes to remind me that when there's conflict, instead of being invited to stand my ground and get defensive and put up my dukes and really prove how I'm right, to instead maybe pause, take a deep breath, and when I feel anxious and conflicted and even angry, to instead get curious. What is it about me and this person that drives our differences? What is it about their heart that hungers and longs a different way than my heart? What is it about their life that has been hurt and heartbroken in a way that maybe mine hasn't and vice versa? And in all the ways that we live together, we are given this ethic from John Wesley to do no harm, to do good, and to strive to stay in love with God. In the ways that I disagree, in the ways that I am different, how am I seeking not to do harm, but to do good? And how am I living to foster that image of God that is already alive in you? It is not the church that makes someone worthy. It is not our faith that makes them worthy. It is the fact that we are created by God We're bound together. We belong together. There is no hierarchy of one more valuable than the other. I pray that we have that kind of vision for how we do faith together, but that kind of vision for how we live among our world together as a different way, a different hope. I would love to wake up one day with this kind of living from people of faith and see my Facebook feed look totally different <laughs> because I'm not trying to prove my point and you're not trying to prove yours, but we are trying to rely on one another, support one another, and see that we truly belong to one another. That's a vision I think that is worth offering our politics and our economics and our philosophies and our communities and our families together. I thank God that Paul and Christ and the Holy Spirit have a better imagination for myself and all of us than I could ever wake up with. Amen. Amen.